I'm going to take um, a couple weeks at least, maybe more, a uh, couple weeks uh, to teach on vision. And, of course, the title of it is kind of catchy, isn't it? 2020 Vision. Uh, I have a, it's kind of unique. I don't, uh, I can't say this very often, but I have an eye exam in the morning at, at 8 o'clock. And uh, I was thinking about that, and I'm like, here's one thing I want the doc to say. You have 2020 vision. And that's what I want you to have in this coming year. 2020 vision. In other words, to be able to see from 20 foot everything you need to see. That's how they determine, and I'm not a doctor, but they determine 2020 vision by how far you stand back and able to see. So if you had 2000 vision, that means you would be able to see, uh, you wouldn't be able to see like a guy, you'd have, it would be like you was 100 foot away and that other guy is 20 foot away. So Chad could be up here, come here Chad. This stage ain't quite 100 foot, but we'll, we'll pretend. Just stand right there. To, to have 20 hundred or, or 20 20, he can see as good back there as I can right here. You can't though, can you? Here's the point I want to make. Whether you're back there or up here, God will increase your vision. And you can go ahead and sit down. Give Chad a hand. He just wanted to get up on stage. That's all it was. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. <laughs> But the, the, the 2020 vision, here's what I know and I want to impart to you before we jump into the message. What you see, if, just hear me closely on this, what you see today is not what you'll be able to see in five years if you'll open yourself up to the Lord. I remember when we first began to think about planting a church, there was no way... Nowhere in me could I see what God has done here. Not was, I was more than 100 foot away. I was miles away. I just could not see it. Why? My vision had not been expanded by the Lord and improved on. This is what's so exciting about serving the Lord. Every year that passes, your vision gets better. Now, this may not sound much like that much to you, but let me say it this way. When I first came into the kingdom, I would hear ministers, I knew I was called to minister, and I would hear ministers talk about their vision, and I would get discouraged because they would see huge things, and they'd had visions, and they'd had dreams, and all kinds of stuff, and I'm like, wow. All I had was I felt like God told me to come do it. That's about it. But I found out after years of serving him, that was okay. When we talk about vision, don't get this mindset that you've got to have a huge vision to have a, a great life, because you don't. What you have to have in vision is what you see that God's put before you. I grew up in the sales world. They were always talking about goals and vision, but their goals and vision were always so much bigger than mine. And I felt less than. If I don't do anything else here today, I want, you to feel, I want you to leave here feeling qualified to do what God told you to do. That's the, that's the whole point of the everything. And, and, and you are qualified to do what God's told you to do. I assure you of that. Vision will guide you. Here's what, here, just give you a couple of notes here. Vision will guide you. It will motivate you. It will energize you as well as your family, your business, and the church. Think about how energized we got because we've been putting up here for several years now, the building's paid for, the parking lot's paved, and the building's full. That was a, that was a vision that we all were behind, and proof is in the eating of the pudding. I mean, it's, we're behind it because it's done. So vision will do that. Uh, it really, in every area of your life, uh, that being said, let's, uh, let's take a look real quick at what the Lord says about vision. In the King James Version, Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. In other words, to have no vision, you'll perish. What does that mean? You'll dry up. You have no motivation. You have no energy. 
Your vision doesn't have to be big like someone else's, but it does need to be there. Your vision can be your family. It, can be your, it should be your family. It should be your business. It should be your church. It should be your own personal goals. What God says to you. Not what he says to me. I made that mistake when I was 18 years old, got in the sales world. I thought my vision was supposed to look like the guys that had been doing it for 30 years. That's frustrating and discouraging. It was years later I found out I could be Danny Dillard and God was okay with that. I could do the things, even today, I don't get sidetracked. I do everything I can to keep from getting sidetracked with my eyes looking at other ministries. I've been around, I've hung out with ministries that do so much more than we do. But I don't get discouraged with it. Why? Because God didn't call me to that. Are y'all with me? Let's take a look at what Eugene Peterson, the guy that wrote the Message Bible, let's look at this verse and how he explained it. It says, if my people, if people can't see what God's doing, they'll stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. What is one thing the Lord's already revealed to us this morning? That we prosper by giving. And the more we want to prosper, the more we purpose in our heart to give. I'll just encourage you at the end of the year. And it's not because we need the money. We're doing fine. It's not, it's not like that. It's because you need the money. <laughs> Me and Bibi have for years thought about what we're going to give the following year. And it's worked out very well for us. And I don't mean that to brag on us because here's the reality. Without God, it wouldn't have worked out at all. I'm bragging on the Lord. Oh, and by the way, Bibi's fine. She's not mad at me. She's just not here. I always, people always want to know where she's at. She's with her mother and father at their church. This is, they've, been, they've been pastoring a little church for a good while now. Today is their last day, and she wanted to be there with her brother and sister-in-law and all to celebrate. And uh, I just needed to be here. Amen. Uh, but anyway, she sends her love. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. What you attend to with what God reveals to you, you'll be blessed with it. Helen Keller says this, The only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. The only thing worse than being blind is having sight and no vision. What's the vision you have for your family? Start with the simplicity stuff. When I came back to the Lord in 1996, you know what my vision was? It was pretty simple. I was at a cross, in my mind's eye, and when I talk about visions, it's things that you'll imagine. You know, I, I used to freak me out when people would, in the church would say, oh, I had a vision. I'm like, really? <laughs> Moses? It, it, kind of, it did. It kind of freaked me out. And I remember years ago, me and Pastor Sheila talking, and we started putting some verbiage to some of the things that we were trying to explain to people. And one of the revelations that God gave us was this, that in your mind's eye, in your imagination, what do you see? Let me tell you one of the things I've seen in 1996 that I've never let go of. And that was that I got saved, I came to a crossroads, I gave my heart to the Lord, I got saved, and I was going to be a churchgoer. Yeah. And it was not an option to me. My kids, when, when, we were, when I was going through divorce, it was just me, and the kids would go with me to church. And I remember Nicholas many times being asleep on the front pew of whatever church we were in. Why? Because I believed Christ died for the church, and I believed I needed to be a part of the church. And, I, and people say, well, can I go to heaven without going to church? I don't know. Talk to the Lord. You, can go, you can't go to heaven without being saved. That's the bottom line. But should you go to church? Yes. Why wouldn't you? The board of directors could throw me out of this church today. I'd find somewhere to worship. Why? Because I believe in the church. I don't believe in the church because I pastor it. I believed in the church before I was pastor. That's a vision. The first couple years I was a pastor, I went to seek the Lord about the vision for the church. You know what God talked to me every time about? For the first few years, all he would talk to me about was my family. 
And when I see them sitting here and I see them working back there and I see them sitting here, I'm encouraged. Why? Because I've seen that vision come to pass. Get a vision. Be able to see stuff. What is vision? The ability to think about or plan the future as revealed by God. To see the invisible. To see the invisible. Now what's the difference? What's a resolution? We're coming on to the New Year's and how many of you have ever set any rev resolutions? Go ahead and raise your hand. Help me out here. How many of you made it through the first week? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've, I've set some and, I, and I've actually made up my mind and I've hit some. A resolution is a firm decision to do or not to do something. And hey, listen, you can, you can make some ground with that. I'm not being negative towards a resolution. There's nothing wrong with you setting a resolution. But having a vision is something totally different because it is the ability to think about or plan the future as revealed by God to see the invisible. Now, I get picked on by my wife sometimes because I am a thinker. What I like to do, if you want to know how to get a vision, here's what works for me. Find out what works for you. I am going to take a walk in the woods or around the yard or through the house or something, and I'm going to be praying sometimes in English, sometimes in the Spirit. But at some point, I need a chair. Why? Because I'm going to sit down and listen to what God's got to say in my spirit. We really, in the Western world today, we really underestimate the power of quietness. We are so fast-paced, McDonald's society, give it to me now, that we forget that we need to meditate. Eastern philosophy and Eastern religion stole from the church the word meditation. Because when we think of meditation, we think of some distorted, man-made Eastern philosophy or religion rather than Christianity. But it goes back to the Old Testament. God told them over and over again, meditate. Take your sons and daughters and teach them the word. Teach them to meditate on the things of the Lord. Meditation. Now part of the word meditation is to mummer too. In other words, don't just meditate and think about what God wants you to do when you receive it in your heart and in your mind, what you feel like you're supposed to do, then you begin to speak it. The Bible says we believe, therefore we speak. It's okay to speak out. I, I promise you we wouldn't be sitting in this building if we hadn't spoke out that we were going to be debt free. That's where Andrew Womack set me free a few years ago at uh, Charlotte at a camp meeting. Is we was teaching, and he and I've shared this with him in a in a in a, in a letter. Is he was talking about you? You cast a vision, you get a vision, but you forget to speak it. Some of you speak it. Some of you business owners, you speak it on the side of your vehicle every day. That's your vision. I'm going to be a company that does this. And it's not huge, but it can become something very great. I always go back to Ray Kroc and McDonald's. I, I just always found this so interesting. The guy had three points, and look what he grew. It was three points to his vision. A milkshake salesman. And three points to his vision, and I hope I can remember them. The food will be consistent at every restaurant. The restrooms will always be clean, and we will always upsell. Now, I don't know about today, but 10 years ago, I was teaching a leadership class, and I'd done some research, and there's only been one time at that time that McDonald's fell short of their, of their goal or really was falling behind, if you will. And when they were, here's what they found out. They'd got off of those three things. Vision will energize you. It'll motivate you. It'll direct you. It'll guide you. What's one of the visions here at the church that we're pressing to in 2020 like never before? Teaching and reaching. We're going to teach and we're going to reach. We're already doing it. We have missionaries in other parts of the world. We have ministries that we sow through that, uh, like my mentor, Dr. Racky, already taught 120,000 pastors and leaders around the world. And we sow into that every month. But we're going to do more of it. Why? Because 
We need to because we're called to because that's our vision. One of the things that happened when I first came into the church and became a minister, one of the things that God showed me early on, the, one of the biggest problems we've had in church is we've not taught people. We've taught them a religious message. We've taught them about church. But many times we didn't teach them about the Word. And many times we didn't make it practical. This today is a very practical message. But don't, be under, don't underestimate it. Just because it's practical, practical doesn't mean it's any less God. Wouldn't be much of a father if he didn't want you to be able to go out and apply it, would it? And he wants you to. The question is not what you look at, but what you see. It's not, the question is not what you look at, but what you see. There was a guy in the Old Testament, Gideon. How many of you have heard of Gideon? What did Gideon see? Here's what I believe Gideon seen above everything. He seen his Lord as faithful. That's the start of any good vision. Do you believe God's able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything you ever hope, ask, or think? Do you see that? Because that's the start of vision. Gideon had 22,000 soldiers. 22,000. The Lord spoke to him about it. He said, reduce your army. He got down to 10,000. And then the Lord gave him a very specific assignment. He said, go down to the, to the branch, go down to the creek. And he said, all of the soldiers, get a drink of water. Have everybody to get a drink of water. He said, the soldiers that get a drink of water and they get down on their knees and just put their mouth on the water and drink, get rid of all those. He said, those that take the water in their hands and cup it up and drink like that, keep those. When it was all said and done, Gideon went from 22,000 to 300 men. You say, wonder why God done that. I think there's a couple reasons. I think the biggest one was total dependence upon God. Because the armies, they say in the book of Judges in 7, you can read it. I don't have time to read the whole story. But they say the armies, the Midianites that they were going up against, were numbered in the numbers of locusts. Have you ever seen a swarm of locusts? I have. Have you ever heard a swarm of locusts? I remember the first time I ever heard of Swam. I was in uh, Elkin or above Elkin, right there at the foot of uh, Stone Mountain, making a sales call. And I got out of my car, and I'm like, what in the world is that? And it was a, it was a, it was a swarm of locusts over in a field not too far from this customer's house. And I was like, wow. And I asked him, I said, what is that? And it's locusts. This is the army that Gideon was coming against. Multiple, I mean, just a massive army. And God said, we don't need but 300. So they went and, here's the other thing, when you read in Judges, he told them when to blow the ram's horn, told them exactly what to do. They done according to God's plan, and it worked according to the plan. This is why it always freaks me out when people say, well, you know, that church is a word church. They just, they believe every word of that. What? I had a pastor one time say to me, oh, I've done been through that faith stuff. I'm like, what? How do you get through faith? We walk by faith. We live by faith. And the moment you say you've arrived, you've missed it. The only time we arrive is when we're in the presence of the Lord in heaven. Then we don't have to believe anymore. We don't have to pray in tongues anymore. We don't have to prophesy anymore. We don't have to hear no teaching anymore. And we're there. But that's the only time. So Gideon won. It was what he seen the Lord doing that made the difference. Philippians 3.12 from the Message Bible says, I'm not, Paul's talking here, he said, I'm not saying that I have this all together, and neither am I. That I have made it, I'm not saying that neither. But I'm well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who so wondrously reached out for me. I just know where I was at in 1996. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially. I was so broke. Uh, broke would have been good. 
when you're in debt about $150,000 and no money and about to lose everything you've got, broke would have been good. I was below broke. I was indebted. If I'd have just been even, it would have been a whole lot easier to make it. But I've done the same thing I'm telling you to do, and I began to apply the principles in this book. I had family members say, are you crazy? What do you mean tithing? You don't even have enough money to live on. And I'd always say the same thing. Me and the Lord's working on something. And I'm here to tell you today, 20-some years later, it worked. And it's nothing to do with me. Because I'm the same guy that it didn't work for for 30 years. I want you to hear this. The same guy without Christ that I had all the potential in the world with jobs. I've had jobs where, listen, there's a guy right now that me and him was in the same business. He's multimillionaire over and over again doing the same thing I was doing, and I failed at it. The same guy without Christ, no success. The same guy with Christ, success according to his word. It's not all about money even though money's what we need to survive in this life. Part of it. Uh, I remember years ago, and this helped me to get over the prosperity of God. People would say, well, I, you know, I don't need a lot of money. Uh, I believe people that say they don't need a lot of money will lie about other things. We do need a lot of money. And we need more money the more we get involved with God. Yeah. Why? Because God will ask you to do things. The greediest we could ever be is when we say, all I need is enough for me and my family. What if a neighbor comes up needing something? You can't help. For a church, I've seen churches do this. Well, all we, knew is, all we need is enough is to keep the power on and keep people paid. That's all we need. No, it's not. We need an abundance. Why? So we can give to every good work, what we talked about in the offering this morning. Philippians 3.13, friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all this. I don't. Paul didn't. I don't neither. But I have got my eye on the goal where, Christ, where God is beckoning us on, onward to Jesus. In other words, get your eyes set on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What, does, what do you mean get your eyes set on Jesus? What does Jesus want you to do? What does he want you to do? What's your part in this 2020 vision of reaching and teaching? Your part's real simple. If you're called to teach, get, in, get with us and we'll try to open some doors for you. Along with what the Lord tells us. But reaching? Every one of us sitting here should be reaching. What is reaching? Telling your neighbor you need to come and hear the word. And I, mean, and I believe many of you are doing that. I see new people come in. So and so invited me. That's your part. What's my part? To study, to believe God, to, to ask God, what do they need to hear? What will help them get from my prayer right outside that door this morning, same one I prayed for the last 17 years. Lord, I don't care what it makes me look like. I don't care what it sounds like. Whatever I say, let it help the people. It's always been my vision. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about you receiving what God has for you and then it applying it to your life. Philippians 3.14, I'm off and running. I'm not turning back. This is vision. A made-up mind. Remember the Tower of Babel? They weren't for God. They were building a tower, said to reach heaven. They were going to do their own thing. And then people preach a lot of different stuff out of that. But I'm going to tell you one of the biggest revelations I ever received out of that is when God said, if we don't go down there and mess up their language, nothing will be impossible with them. What was that? They made up their mind they were going to do something. Even without God, God recognized he's going to have to mess this up or they're going to succeed. Now, think with me. Stay with me. If God, if, if they could do that for their own potential, what can we do and God be with us? If God be for you, who could possibly be against you? I'm telling you, with God you can't lose. The only way you lose with God is to walk away or quit. Philippians 3.15. So, let, so let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us. How many of you want everything God has for you? It's, that's the abundant life he has for us. 
I don't want to just pastor Lifeway Church. I want to do everything he's told me to do. Starting January the 7th, I'm going back to Bible college. I hadn't taught in two years, and, and they've asked me to come back and teach some leadership. And I'm doing it, and just to be totally honest with you as the church, it will never take away, and those that's been here know this, it will never take away from what I'm doing here. It adds to it. It helps me. It sharpens me. And honestly, the first I'm, I'm teaching a semester uh, of leadership, and the reason that one of the reasons I'm doing it, I believe it'll benefit the, the students, the interns, but I also believe it'll help me clear my head for what's the next iteration for Lifeway Church because there's a lot of stuff out there God wants us to do. And part of my job is to figure out what it is with my team and then, and then cast that vision, that part of reaching and teaching because this church will not look like the, it does today a year from now. And neither will your life. So let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Isn't that encouraging? You're sitting here today and you're like, you know, pastor's excited about this stuff, but I just don't see it. It's okay. God will clear up your vision. Remember, I started the message. The things I see today, I didn't see 20 years ago. This is so hopeful to me with God. It doesn't matter what you see today, God can expand your vision. He can show you other things. I think of the story with Elisha and his servant. It is found in the uh, book of 2 Kings, about the 6th chapter. And the servant woke up and he seen these, all these chariots and all these people surrounded him and Elisha. Elisha didn't get worried. Why? He's God's man. You're God's man or woman. Don't worry. That's, that's not God. Worry's not of God. Worry's of your enemy. What is worry? It's faith in reverse. That's all it is. Anytime you think about worry, just like, uh-oh, faith is in reverse. I got to change this. We we'll have some scripture here, maybe may help that clear up. But anyway, Elisha and his servant was there, and God and, and Elisha just prayed a simple prayer. And sometimes it'd do us well to do this. Just a simple prayer. He said, Lord, he said, open my servant's eyes so he can see what's really going on. All of a sudden, the guy's eyes opened up, and he looked around all the hills, all the way around. And there was chariots of fire, angels surrounding them. And Elijah said, there's more with us than there is with them. We got this. Amen. And I'm here to tell you today, there's more with you than what you see. Amen. There's more people praying for you than you think's praying for you. There's more pe people believing for you than, than you think sometimes. But here's the, here's the reality. God's with you, and that's really all that matters. I don't pray to see angels. Every time I read in the Bible where an angel showed up, everybody said, you know, the first thing the angel said was fear not. And the second thing was usually they laid out on their face. I'm not one, that, and I'm not saying you're wrong to pray to see an angel. I'm just saying I'm not one that's ever been all into that. But do I believe angels exist? Absolutely. Are they around us now? Yeah. We don't worship them. We don't put, we never put an angel above Jesus Christ. But there are a reality. Jesus said this before going to the cross. There's, you know, Peter's trying to get him to not go to the cross. He said, listen, hush. I'm putting it in my words. Hush, Peter. He said, do you not realize I could call down 10,000 legions or 1,000 legions of angels and I'd be out of here? He recognized they were there. He even told Nathaniel, he said, you're going to see them ascending and descending. What happened with his servant and Elisha? They seen the angels of God around them. They're still there. They ain't gone nowhere. God's got you. So if your vision is blurred, don't worry about it. God will open it up. He'll show you. Habakkuk 2.2 says this, and then God answered. They were asking about what to do, and he said, write this. Write what you see. Write it out in big block letters so that it can be read on the run. Now, what, where does this come into vision? Real simple. Let me recap and close all. We're going we're to work this thing together where you can get a hold of it. 
When you go pray, when you listen to God, don't even, don't never go to God in prayer without a pen and a paper near you. Let that be a New Year's vision or resolution. Why? Because there's things that's going to come up in your spirit that you need to capture. You say, oh, I'll remember it. I'll quote my mentor of years ago. Yeah, short pencil is better than a long memory. Jot it down. And it doesn't matter what you write it on. I have sticky notes, index cards laying all over the house. It doesn't matter about that. It doesn't have to be formal. Just write it down so, or put it on your phone. But don't forget it. You say, well, how do I know if it's God speaking to me? It'll come to pass. God said we'd build debt free. How do I know it was God? Ta-da. Well, let's, let's just say that we ended up have to, if we had ended up borrowing money, would that make God any less? No, it made I didn't hear something right. God's never wrong. <laughs> I, I, that, was a, that was a humbling thing to admit years ago, but when I miss it, it's not God. Are y'all with me? All right, so when you sit there and you pray and you hear things, you write them down, and then you write them in a way that you know what you're going to do. Let's say you have a business. Take where you're at right now. I know I, I'm looking around the room. There's several businessmen and women in here. Take this year's income and just begin to pray and ask God what kind of increase you want. And don't get crazy. I've seen people get crazy. Well, you know, our company brought in 100000 this year. I, I really think, you know, $8 million next year ought to be good. Harvard will tell you the worst, business school will tell you the worst thing you can do is grow too quick. I'd never experienced that until I was with ADT. I'm sitting downtown Krispy Kreme Donuts in Winston-Salem. We were making a call on them, and it absolutely to this day still blows my mind. It was when Krispy Kreme had just went west. Y'all remember that? They had always been just a southeast company that went west, I think Vegas, some different places. I'm in the lobby of that corporation with one of the other salespeople. Little lady answering, the little girl answering the phone. She said, I'm sorry, sir. Right now we can't do anything because we, are, we, we just don't have the resources to, to offer you a franchise. It wasn't two minutes later, phone rung again. because we was in the lobby a good while waiting on this, one of the CEOs or one of the directors or somebody. And, and so, I'm sorry, we, we can't do anything because we don't have the resources. She's turning down franchises that are worth millions of dollars because they can't supply the need. I'm saying all that to say, don't look at how great your business can grow. Put a number that God gives you to it and watch it happen. Same for ministry. We, we've grown consistently in 17 years. But my board will tell you, my executive uh, council will tell you, I'm never going crazy and say, well, you know, we've done this year. Let's double next year. No. It may be 5%. It may be 10%. It's whatever I feel God's showing me that we can do. And with church, it's more about, you know, how many more people can we reach? How much more ministry can we sow into? Because we don't collect money and hoard it up. We, we reinvest it in the kingdom. Make a decision how you're going to run your business, your ministry. Are you going to be a giver to the ministry to, by your business? I mean, all these things is things you and the Lord can work out. But when you work it out, write it out plain. And then all you got to do is follow the road map. The vision, the message is a witness pointing to what's coming. It aches for the coming. It can hardly wait. It doesn't lie. It seems slow in coming. If it, if it seems slow in coming, wait. It's on its way. It will come right, at, right on time. Don't let your lack of patience cause you to throw up your hands and say, this is not working. You know, the worst thing we can do in faith is, is go out, step out in faith, and then tell God, I don't know why this ain't working. It's not that it's not working. It's just that it's not working in our timetable. If God said it, it'll happen. 
And don't buy into this lie that a lot of people are selling. Well, you can't hear from God. That's, that's ridiculous. Well, what are you going to do with John 10? He said, my sheep hear my voice and another one they won't follow. What do you do with that? I mean, you're going to rip it out of here? No. You can hear. You may hear different than me and I may hear different than you, but you can hear. And God will, we talked about this last week, God will guide you in a dream. He'll, he'll guide you in his word. He'll remind you of a scripture. He'll remind you of something that happened in your life that was a success or a failure. I've had God to guide me by showing me a failure in my life and showing me that you shouldn't go that way. Don't do that. Hebrews 11.1, 1, last scripture. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about the things we cannot see. And when we're talking about here the things you cannot see, I'm talking about, and I believe Hebrews is talking about this, the things that you can't see with your natural eyes. Because see, faith and vision sees the invisible. I know <clears throat> there's been many things on a, on a personal level that, that God showed me that, that uh, even material things, where God would show me that that was part of who I was and that was part of my life. And I would see it in the invisible, but then it manifested in the visible. I've seen things in the church same way. But faith is the confidence that what we hope for. Where's your hope at? This is why we need a vision. Why? Because the vision will energize you. It'll motivate you. It'll guide you. So when you have that, you're, you're assured of hope. When you have that stuff inside of you, you say, oh, and, and I just heard this in the spirit. There's somebody here, maybe more than one. You're, you're, you're saying right now, that's fine for you, but you don't know where I'm at. I'm so discouraged right now with my life. I can't even get a hope. Yes, you can. Just don't try to get your neighbors. Get yours. What's, what's the vision God may give you? He may give you the one he gave me in 96. Become a churchgoer. Hear everything you can on the word and just believe it. It'll work out. Maybe you've never tithed and then all of a sudden God says, this is where we're going to start. 1996, October, my first tithe. <laughs> it's pitiful, pitiful, but I'm just being honest with you. I think it was $10. I'd made 100 finally. But there's been many times since then, God's just done amazing things, and he wants to do that for you. So don't let, him, don't let the enemy discourage you that where you are, that you can't go farther, because you can that's the cool thing about serving the Lord, not out in the world. The world tells you, Hollywood tells you, the news tells you that you've got to be born into this, you've got to have this, you've got to have it. Jesus said, all you that labor, come to me, I'll give you rest. He is no respecter of person. It doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter what you've done. That is the coolest thing with God. He, doesn't, he does not consult your past to determine your future. He don't have to. Why? Because it's a brand new future. The past is gone. It's done away with. When we get born again, that is over. Now your friends will remember it. Your neighbors will remember it. And some of them will be so kind to remind you. How many of you are serving the Lord now that every once in a while somebody will walk up to you and remind you what you used to do? That's okay. It's okay. Don't get bent out of shape with that. Just, take, just tell them, say, Sure. I did. I'm not going to apologize for it. It's over. I'm forgiven. Life lesson is this. What we focus on is what we will see. As we focus on the plan God has, has for our family and our church, we will see it come to pass. What do you focus on? Focus on what God has for you. Focus on what you know Scripture to be. I'll, sh I'll close with this one last story. Years ago, 1971, Mike Vance, which was the creative director for Disney World in Florida. In 1971 was opening day in Florida for Disney World, and it was almost five years 
after the death of Walt Disney. So in other words, he died five years later, Walt Disney, I mean Disney World opened. And someone spoke up and said to Mike Vance, says, isn't it too bad Walt Disney didn't live to see this? I love his response. He did see it, Vance replied simply. That's why it's here. I can tell you, now I ain't built no Walt Disney, but I can tell you this building sitting right where it's at doesn't look a whole lot different than the first time I walked on this property with Ed Kivett and Chuck Quinn, and we put some orange, y'all guys remember that? We put some orange, Chad may have been with us, I think he was with us, and put some orange tape around this facility. We went through an architect, paid good money for an architect to draw another building, but when it came time to build that building, God stopped me. That's not your building, and we're at an impasse. And then we built the building God had showed me in the beginning. Walt Disney built Disney World. He never got to see it. But he's seen it. And I'm telling you, whatever you build in your life, you will see it in here first. You got to see yourself serving God. You got to see yourself successful in the kingdom. You got to see it in your mind's eye, in your spirit, whatever you want to say. Craig Crochelle, which is a great visionary, says in his book he wrote called It, here's what he says about vision, and this is, you won't be able to capture it all probably, but you could read the book or pull it up online. He says, seek God, same thing I've been saying all day, seek God, hear from God, receive his vision, let it overwhelm you, consume you, burden you. Tell the vision, speak it out, give life to it. Cast the vision. Communicate the vision and watch it spread. It's hard to stop a train. How many of you know that line? What was that? Vision. I quoted it Tony Frost one day. He said, yeah, he works in HVAC. He says, hard to start one too. <laughs> what did they do though? They cast their vision. Whatever your vision is, cast it. See it. Let it overwhelm you. Give life to it. It'll happen. Welcome to Lifeway Church, where you can... That's what we're a vision to do. My desire every time you walk through these doors is to experience the Lord. To love Him to love each other, and to serve. Serve what? Any way he tells you. It's not legalistic. It's not trying to trap people, corner them, tell them what to do. It's about hearing God and you responding. Are y'all, did y'all receive this today? Mm -hmm.